Amen. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll go to the Lord, ask Him to help us. Do keep uh, Sister Barbara and her brother in your prayers, if you would, and uh, Brother Fernando. Uh, I haven't heard from him, so that's not a good thing. Amen. Let's go to the Lord. Lord God, we sure do thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for just allowing us to be able to be here. Pray that you'd just uh, be with our study this evening. Pray that you'd be with your preacher, God. Pray that you'd give him the wisdom that he needs, Lord, and uh, just uh, the words to be able to uh, present it to us. God, pray that you'd be with our hearts, be with our minds, Lord. Help us to be receptive to your word, Lord. You said... Uh, that uh, the Bereans were, were more noble than the Thessalonians and that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind, Lord, and that's what we want, Lord, and I pray that you'll just uh, help us to receive it, Lord. We thank you. We pray that you'd bless us now, for it's in your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Brother Zeb, you want to come up here? Uh, I asked Brother Zeb if he would come and uh, teach... Uh, a uh, little class on on the call, uh, and so it's good to have him all the way from Mississippi or Florida, one of those two, <laughs> or South Carolina, I guess. <laughs> but, hey, man, it's good to have you. All of the above. Thank you, <clears throat> and it's good to be here with you tonight, and I'm uh, excited about doing a study with you on the calling of God. It is an uh, important part of my life. I've spent now 36 years working as a result of accepting the call of God on my life. And so I'm always excited to talk about that. I was saved 38 years ago, and I began to seek the Lord's will in my life, and I wanted to come become fully surrendered. I did. 36 years ago, I came to that place where I believed the Lord had put a call on my life to preach the gospel, and uh, I surrendered to him to do just that, and have been doing so now all these years. I'm happy about it. I'm excited about it. And uh, I'm in it for life, and uh, that's an exciting thing when you don't have to question all the time what you're supposed to be doing next, and I'm thankful for that. Happy to be with you. We are from everywhere is uh, south uh, east of here, so <laughs> that's pretty much the answer. Uh, we've just uh, recently left uh, work in Florida and are moving and relocating back in South Mississippi to our home church to uh, work in missions with our pastor and, uh, and accomplish some things there which are right now uh, complicated not easy for me to explain how that's going to work out but we're in the middle of that the Lord's opening doors for us and uh, we travel I guess m most simply as an evangelist the Lord's been opening doors for us just to preach revivals and meetings camp meetings and special meetings here lately and I'm thrilled about all that, too. We're excited about it. I want to share with you, uh, this is a simple outline. It's, it's a topical outline, but I was asked to speak on topics such as the, the call of the minister. I'm going to share what I call the ABCs. That ought to be simple enough, right, for this college level. The ABCs of a minister's call. And uh, so I'd like to begin, if you would please, take your Bibles and, and uh, find Acts chapter number 9. Acts chapter number nine, and um, we'll we're gonna we're gonna go to these verses. A lot of times when preaching, you'll hear a preacher say, "You don't have to turn there," but when we're in class, you do. So yeah, you need to get there, and you need to see it with your own eyes, and you need to be able to mark it and examine it for yourself. That's what we'll try to do tonight. So we'll call the scripture and give time for everybody to get to the particular text, and then. Um, and then we'll go from there. So Acts chapter number 9. You're familiar with the story, so I'm going to give that real quick and, and then we'll move on. Acts chapter 8, Stephen is being stoned and we're introduced to a man named Saul who was beside the scene and uh, at least giving his blessing and authority for the scene of the stoning of Stephen in chapter number 8. We come to Saul's conversion, as a lot of Bibles will talk uh, and, and uh, will text, uh, title this particular portion of Scripture. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against 
the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled. And astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now I'll start here because though we're dealing with conversion, there's an important thing that I want to build and develop out of this that uh, we begin with the letter A, and that is the authority of the word of God the authority of the Word of God. And if you'll notice in the text that I've just read, that in verse number 2, Saul desired letters to Damascus and to the synagogue specifically. That was his letters of authority. He acted upon those letters of authority. It was his passport to go into other places, and while uh, entering into those places, to be able to be the... um, Authority on behalf of the high priest to arrest anyone who was participating in what we would call Christian faith. Now, when the apostle, well, at this particular point, the the uh, uh, persecutor of the church, by his own language, that's what he called himself, persecutor of the church, is acting, and he knows he cannot go without authority, and so he needs that letter, that authority. And he asks for it, gets the letter, and uh, that promotes him to uh, a place to be able to go and achieve what it is that he has in his mind to do, and that's uh, persecute the church. There's an issue that takes place in the text that's important, and that's his conversion when the authority changes. If you'll notice what your Bible says, this is important. As he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, he fell to the earth and heard a voice. It's important that you notice in verse number four of this phrase that he heard a voice. I want to clarify something really quick because I know this always comes up when I deal with this particular portion of scripture, that we in present day do not have uh, the luxury of a light shining down from heaven and a voice that thunders, and and that's how we receive our words. We have something far better than that. We have the word of God, the written word of God. And uh, this logos that we have, spoken, recorded, written, and given to us becomes authority in his life. And so uh, now there are people, you're going to run into people who have whatever they have in their life as ministry or uh, salvation or whatever it is they're discussing, they'll have some experiential tale that will go along with that. So let's talk about that uh, just for a moment before we move on. Um, I, I met a lady one time in Birmingham, Alabama. She said, I know I'm saved. She said, an angel came into my room one night, light shone down on him, and he touched me on the toe. And, uh, and that's how she said she was confident of her, her conversion. Now, she would like to have what the apostle had, the, the Saul in this text, but the, the problem with that is, is the light stopped shining that way. Now the light shines by us giving the word of God. The word of God is the light that shines, and that was clarified to us in the scripture. Now the true light shines. Yeah. And so we have the true light. Now we don't need a light shining down from heaven. We have the word of God. But it would be to the advantage of many people to claim an experiential situation to tag on to their conversion or their calling, whatever the case may be. So let's get past that and realize, and I believe we all agree, that's not how the Lord works now. He leads us through his yeah. word. Yeah, amen. And, uh, but he was leading through his word here. He just didn't have it, a written word. He had a spoken word of God. He heard a voice. And now, what's what happens after he hears a voice saying, verse number four, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? 
Notice what happens next. Trembling and astonished in verse number 6, he says, What wilt thou have me to do? He comes to full submission to that word and allows the word of God to become an authority. And then the word of God says to him in verse number 6, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee. Again, notice the word. If you're marking things in your Bible, notice this word, told. It shall be told thee what thou must do. In other words, the sum of these verses for us is, one, we know Paul was converted in this, in this chapter, and he later gives that testimony. We're going to go and talk about that in just a moment in chapter number 26. But before we move on, the simplicity of the text. Don't overlook the simplicity of the text. He heard the word of God. He responded to the word of God. He submitted to the word of God. And the word of God gave direction for the next thing that should happen in his life, in which case would be the rest of his life of following that word that he heard and that he would receive. It's a progression. He hears the word of God and says, what will thou have me to do in verse number 6? He is going to have to hear the word of God again and again and again as he goes forward and, and submits to the authority of the word of God. Take your Bibles when you... Uh, get through noting that. Take your Bible to chapter 26. And um, Acts holds the short history of the life of the apostle. And so now we have him on trial. And particularly he's, he's uh, standing before uh, Agrippa in this particular text of chapter 26. And uh, he's telling the story we just read. So I'm going to pick up in verse number 14 where we left off. When we... Uh, were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Arise, stand upon your, thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of those things which thou hast seen and those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient under the heavenly vision. We'll stop there with verse number 19. He expounds a little bit more about the communication that he received. And the communication that he received declared him to be a minister and a witness. A minister and a witness. Of what? Of the things he had seen that day and the things that would he would see, the appearance of those things as he would go forward. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the authority of the Word of God. We preach to sinners, they must be born again. And we get that from the Word of God. It's not a church fathers got together, figured out a way for the Baptists to preach it and teach it and so that we could be different than the Methodists or the Presbyterians or, yeah. or somebody else, the Catholics or whatever. No, it's not how that works. We clearly go right back to the Word of God, open up the Word of God, and then give authority to the Word of God. How does a person get saved? According to the Scriptures, Amen. There, is, there is a must. They must be born again. According to the Scriptures. Amen. We preach a gospel that Paul preached, that according to the Scriptures, he died. Amen. He was buried. And he rose again, how? According to the Scriptures. Amen. And we deal with that authority. We, we hold that authority. That's our letters. Like Paul's movement to Damascus was his authority by those letters given to him by the chief priest. We now act upon authorities. And that authority is the word of God. It is a must that when we talk about the call of a minister that we start with the authority of the word of God. Because there are some mama called preachers. And, um, and there's some... Uh, good-hearted people have called a few people into the ministry. Sure. You know, yeah. uh, we look at talent, yeah. and uh, it's it's hard for us not to see somebody with the right personality and say, "You ought to be preaching. You ought to be preaching. You ought to be preaching." Right. 
but uh, that won't hold up. You're not going to get there with just a buddy situation or you're not going to get there with a family situation or an authority of your friends or spouse or whatever. As a matter of fact, most spouses I know that are married to a preacher are saying, I don't even know why God called you. <laughs> I'm not even yeah. sure why you're in the ministry. I got one of those. <laughs> yeah, I felt, I felt like there might be some camaraderie there. You, you have to have something greater than it. And so there has to be properly a pro properly placed authority in the Word of God. That we're doing what we're doing because the Word of God says this is what we ought to be doing. And that's leadership of the Word of God. Now, uh, this was not in my notes, but I'm going to, we're on the authority of the Scriptures, right? So let's just stay with it for just a moment. Go with me and look, uh, if you would please, at, um, let me see. Uh, I think I'm going to go to 2 Thessalonians. Ah, First Thessalonians. I told you it wasn't in my notes. First Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the words of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh, also in you that believe. Paul's thankful to the church of Thessalonica for their obedience to the word of God. Brings me back to my point. I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of, in my mind, I'm thinking of Paul's movement is because of the word of God. But then Paul's message is the word of God. Authority is properly placed in the word of God. His movements are according to the word of God. And his message is according to the word of God. And when he's preaching... To them, the word of God, he says, I'm thankful that when you received it, you did not receive it as it were the words of men. And people think that sometimes. Well, preacher, that's what you say. Well, preacher, that's what you say. Well, that's, that's what you believe. There's a greater authority here, and it is the properly placed authority in the word of God that it is not my, my decision or my opinion or my consensus, or the consensus of me and my brethren. It is the very word of God. And so before we go into being a minister, there needs to be a properly placed authority here. And that is the authority of the Word of God. Yeah. Uh, and I say that because I believe it's a necessity. Hebrews chapter 4 verse number 2 says, It wasn't always this way. They heard the gospel the same as we heard the gospel, but it did not work in them because they did not have faith mingled with the Word of God. The Word of God didn't have the same effect in them because they didn't believe the power, the authority of the Word of God. Before you go too far into ministering, we need a, a properly placed authority of the Word of God. And so I, I would question that. In my own mind, in your own mind, stop and think, what is the authority of the Word of God in my life? Mm -hmm. I would uh, I'd be careful here not to impress on anyone to be a carrier of a book they do not properly place authority on. Let me say that. A different way, maybe I can make sense of that in simplest terms here. We have enough people in our pews who do not place the authority where it needs to be placed when it comes to the Word of God. We sure don't need any more preachers declaring the Word of God they don't really believe in. Yeah. And so we need a properly placed authority here. The Baptists say this. This is one of the Baptist distinctives. The Bible is the final authority for our faith and practice. Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you believe that? Well, I believe it should be, but I don't believe in most churches that that's the case. Yeah. I believe there needs to be a properly placed authority here, and there needs to be the Word of God. Um, we had a, a, a move of God, a great move of God, in the church I was in in Florida. I believe it was a great reviving work of God, even though it didn't turn out like we think. You think normally a revival, in the end, the church will be blessed. People will be saved. There will be a big turn of things that happen. Well, here's The revival we had was a revival of revealing. The Lord began to move. I began to preach verse by verse, actually word by word, through the <coughs> book of Jude on ungodly men. And by the time I got to verse number 15, my assistant pastor resigned because he believed drinking alcohol was okay and, and that he felt like he needed to change from the, uh, the authorized King James Version to another version. And so it was a revelation. Within days, my piano player resigned 
because of the same. He felt like that drinking alcohol was okay. Now, you, you drink alcohol. You can be wrong if you want to. I believe it's a sin. Yeah. Amen. And I'm a teetotaler. I don't have any business uh, or any idea that the, any Bible believer has any business drinking alcohol. That's the way I feel about it. Yeah. However, in the authority of God's Word, by preaching and developing the Scripture and showing forth the Word of God about ungodly men, he turned the light on and shined it down and revealed ungodly men. I could have never done that on my own. Yeah. If I had tried, it would have been to no avail. But the fact was, I was completely shocked by both of those men who made that decision. Now, they're not the only ones. We had a, we had a regular uh, a parting of the waters around there, and there were several people that left. And during the preaching of God's word on ungodly men, that's a real good time for you to make a stand, wave your flag up high, and say, <laughs> I'm out. And so we had a great move of God. Uh, again, that's not the move of God I would have expected. That's not how you normally think of a move of God, but sometimes it is. Yeah. Sometimes there has to be uh, Pharaoh's army floating in the sea, and God has to do those things. If I had, what I'm saying is I had taken it upon myself to say, I think that guy's got something, I'm going to blast it, and I'm going to preach it, and I'm going to point him out, and I'm going to tell it. I probably wouldn't have achieved what God achieved during those days, but because I only preached the Word of God and I placed proper authority in the Word of God, I let the Word of God have its proper place, Amen. and it revealed sin, Amen. and it turned out to be a great move yeah. of God because it was by His Word. That's good. There has to be properly placed authority in the Word of God. There are preachers, so-called, claimed, I don't know, but they're so-called, claimed in the ministry, because they sit on the pew and they feel like they could do a better job than the pastor could. Yeah. Wrong motive. Wrong purpose to get in the ministry. Amen. And there are a lot of people that like to jump right up there, you know, well, if, it was, if it was me, if it was me, I'd do things different. I'm sure you would. But uh, that's, not, that's not the proper authority. To act upon authority of the wrong motivation or the wrong move uh, uh, such as that, Put you in a place to accomplish selfishness leads to selfishness. You'll lead people to become selfish. You'll draw people away from God. There are people who are acting that's not really by the word of God at all. It's, it's more about self-motivation. There was a preacher, and, and his grandfather explained this story to me not long ago. He went to Pensacola Christian College and, and get him a degree so he could become a pastor. And so he went to Pensacola Christian College and he graduated. And in his last year, he started sending out resumes to let people know that he was graduating and he was going to become a pastor. And so the church has started to contact him upon the, the time frame of his uh, graduation and see if they could interview him for pastorate. And so one of his questions was, what kind of uh, uh, salary package and, and benefits do you have? And so they told him. And so uh, he decided to throw that degree away, go back to school and become a paralegal so he could make more money. Yeah. If you're in it for the wrong motive, you're in it. You're not going to succeed, and it's not a true call of God for those things to be done. Properly placed authority in God's word gives the authority to the word of God, and that's the first place it needs to start when they're when we're talking about a calling to the ministry. If the word of God does not have its rightful place in your life, it will not have its rightful place in your ministry. There has to be a properly placed authority in the word of God. So the bad to say. Bible is our final authority for faith and practice. Now, what that means in plain terms is the Bible is where we get our beliefs, and that changes our behavior. It dictates our behavior. What we believe dictates how we behave. That's the simplicity of that. So a person who does not have properly placed authority there in the Word of God cannot be a, a God-called man or follow a God calling to be a minister. Yeah. It's an absolute must. I, I suspect you used the King James Bible because I saw a sign out front that said you used the King James Version. And uh, I'm glad we don't have to guess and wonder about that. Uh, I don't know which version you use. And when I say that, I guess I should say revision that you use. But uh, be sure that you have an accurate uh, writing of the scriptures, be sure you have it. I do not say out loud uh, in, in a normal setting that I, am a, uh, that I read out of the King James 1611. 
or that I preach out of the 1611 or that I'm a 1611 only King James guy because, uh, well, you have a copy here I saw over there and, <laughs> and my kids couldn't wait to open it up to see if I was right, but they had a struggling time to read through that thing and so they, I made them read some verses so they could see. <laughs> so uh, I don't like that to use that because when I do, I feel like what happens is sometimes there are people who are just looking for you to mess up. And the minute you say 1611 and they look and they look at a 1611, you don't have a 1611. I don't think anybody in here is reading out of one right now. They got you. As soon as they get you in a cross, they got you. So I do like to say the authorized King James Version. And, uh, and I believe that. This, that's the book for us that are English speaking. When we're dealing with English speaking people, that's the book. And so uh, that's what I, I read out of. I personally uh, have gone a little bit further in that and continue to go further in that in my studies, and I personally prefer to use uh, the uh, Cambridge text, around 1900 Cambridge text, and I could explain why, and it's something that me and my kids have been working on uh, of late to try to teach them how to be careful with those 12 errors that are in a lot of the uh, late 1700 to 1800 revisions. And so, uh, why? I want them to have the right book. That's the simplicity of it. Sure. And uh, then by me doing that, I'm teaching them more than one thing. I'm teaching them not only should they have a book that has it on the cover, but now uh, just because they may pick up a Bible and it may say King James Version on the cover, that's real good. Mm -hmm. But not if you're not going to open it up yeah. and read it and believe what it says on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. So when I confidently can trust you to know why you carry in this Bible... That's a good step, but now I want you to understand that book has to have authority in your life. If it does not have authority in your life, carrying it around and waving it at people and hollering KJV will not be enough to change your life or anybody else's. There needs to be properly placed authority in the Word of God. Now, how can I sum that up? Simply by saying this. It's more about doing what it says than it is about owning how many copies you have. You can have 100 copies in your house if you don't do what it says it's not going to do you any good. Mm -hmm. You can have uh, 10 verses memorized in your head, but if you don't do what the Bible says, it's not going to do you any good. So we need to start with the properly placed authority of God's Word. What is the authority of God's Word in your life? Let me, let me ask. Don't, don't answer out loud. I, I'm sure probably 100,000 people are watching this online. <laughs> and um, I wouldn't want anyone to have their testimony out there. I've already put mine out there. It's probably going to hurt me later. It'd be fine. Well, let me ask, what are you doing right now that you do according to the Word of God? Meaning, I know what I'm doing in my life right now is because of what I know about the Word of God. You may say, I'm saved, and I know that I'm saved according to the Word of God. Well, that's a good place to start, because that's why John said that he wrote so that we may know that we have eternal life. Mm -hmm. And so that's good. What else are you doing? What movements have you made? What callings have you accepted? What ministry are you involved in? What thing are you doing that you can say, well, I can take you back to a message or a, a devotion or a time spent in the Word of God, and I can show you... This is why I'm doing what I'm doing, and the, the Word of God has that authority in my life. The strange thing is that when I preach this and teach this around the country, around the world, there are people who know they're saved according to the Scriptures. That's as far as they can go. They cannot tell me anything else that they are doing because the Bible said so. Somebody always likes to come up and tell me because... I go out and I witness, I go out on visitation and I go witness because of Matthew 28 and, there, and that's good. What are you doing right now that you can say, I'm doing this because of the word of God? Do you have one thing? Do you have two things? Do you have three things? When I was praying about a, a, the, the call of God on my life, my, which I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more in just a minute, but the Lord gave me a Bible verse. It's been my life verse ever since. Exodus 33, 21. I've never gotten away from it. When the Lord... And Moses were conversing about the glory. He wanted to see God, and he said, I'll show you my glory. This is the Lord's response to Moses. There is a place by me. And when I came to that in the scriptures, there is a place by me. Thou shalt stand upon a rock. 
I came to that place in the scripture and I felt the peace of God assure me through the word of God that if I would be with him, that he would give me a place to stand on his word. And I would, I would use that word and I wouldn't have to worry about what to say because I didn't know what to say to the people. I wouldn't have to hunt for messages. Back then we didn't really have internet it's accessible, so I didn't even know about SermonOutline.com. Yeah. <laughs> well, where was I going to get my messages? I have Mace Jackson's Golden Nuggets. Maybe I would work yeah. off of that. Uh, but but the, the dilemma, what would I say? What, what would I present? What would I say? The Lord assured me, if you'll just be with me, I'll, I'll put you in a place where you have a place to stand, where you have something to say. And depending on that word of God has saved me a lot of trouble and caused me a lot of trouble. The same. Yeah. But I just stay with that word. Standing on that rock. Being with him. And so I, I ask again, what are you doing that you know you're doing according to the word of God? The word of God has led you and showed you this is what you're doing. I gave a similar thought the other day in the service and I said I'm going to give you a participation trophy. That's what people like in this day and time. And I said we're all in church so at least you got that one right, you know. I'm doing. I'm, I'm in church because the Lord said not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So that's a participation trophy for everybody that attends church. Boom! We're doing something the Bible told us to do. What else are you doing that you do know for, for fact? I'm moving and acting according to the Word of God. So back to our subject, Paul, who as Saul heard the voice of the Lord and received commission of the Lord, changed from the letters of the high priest to the letters of God, and then spent out his life, and if you go back to chapter 26 and uh, sum this up with verse number 19, he was able to conclude his life with this thought in verse number 19, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Plain terms. I did what he told me to do. I obeyed what he said. I have acted upon the authority of the word of God. Since that day on that road to Damascus when I heard him speak, I have moved and acted according to that vision and now it has brought me to this point where I can end my life knowing I was not disobedient to the heaven of vision. Now, I'm not uh, hopeful that anyone here is fixing to die by no means. Let me just ask you. If you, were, if you were to die, the grand question that we always ask, if you, know, if, if you were to die today, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven to be with the Lord when you die? And people like to say yes to that if they're saved. Right? Yeah. But I'm going further than that. If you were to die today, could you have it etched in your tombstone? I was obedient to the heavenly vision. In other words, I did what the Word told me to do. I lived by it and I'm ready to die by it. That's important. If we don't get past the authority of the Word of God, we have nothing else to stand on. The authority of the Word of God, that's where it must start. Let's go to the second. I don't think it'd be too far-fetched for us to uh, know what letter comes next, right? We're in the ABCs, so we've got the authority. So what's next? Next, I believe, is the burden of the Word of God. The burden of the Word of God. Let's look at a, a few Old Testament passages. If you don't mind flipping back to the Old Testament, look with me in Habakkuk just for a moment. Verse number one of chapter number one. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. The burden. The Hebrew word is Mesa, M A S S A. Burden. It is. A word that describes a load that is put on a working animal. If we were to take a, a burrow into the field and laid it 
with the work. Carrying tools and carrying supplies or carrying uh, the bounty from a harvest or whatever it is. And then moved that beast to bear that load. Which some would tell you quickly if they're familiar with that, that that beast is designed for that purpose. God made it to bear the load. The burrow has a great unique way of, of, of distributing that load out and, and structurally able to maintain that load. Other animals, big and strong, can't bear the same weight that that burrow can bear. That's, that's what Habakkuk described when he talked about how God conveyed what must be given to the people. He described it as a burden, and amazingly enough, if we put it in that context, a burden for which we were designed to carry. A burden for the word of the Lord. When I think of the burden of the word of God, I'm reminded of how when I, when I first started, am I... I'm a third generation Christian, third generation preacher in my family. And uh, my grandfather was the first in our family for a long time to, uh, to give his life to the Lord and then preach the gospel. And, and uh, then he passed away 46 years ago, went home to be with the Lord. My dad followed him preaching the gospel and still pastors right now, uh, pastor church of Pickens, South Carolina. Great man of God. I'm thankful for that heritage. I picked that up, and I've carried that. Now, I didn't become a preacher because my grandfather was. My daddy made sure I didn't try to do that. He talked me out of it. I didn't become a preacher because my daddy was, but I am thankful that they were preachers of the gospel and that I'm carrying on in that, in that vein. Now, that's, that's something that uh, I'm proud, if you want to use that terminology, of the heritage. I'm pleased that I have a godly heritage and not an ungodly heritage. I'm thankful that my family has given themselves to serve the Lord. Amen. But I couldn't stand and preach because my grandfather did. I couldn't stand and preach because my dad did. I had to have my relationship with the Lord. Right. And I remember after I got saved that uh, I would see things in the scripture while preachers preach it. And I'd have my pen and I would, I would mark it. And uh, wasn't as if I was the first one to ever see it. Somebody had. I found that out later. <laughs> yeah. But at the time, I was convinced. Wow. Oh, I just yeah. saw something in the Word of God nobody else has ever seen. Yeah. And uh, I would take those things back and I would write them down. And next thing you know, I would start to notice other scriptures confirming those things and building a thought. And I would put those things together. And I wasn't even, I wasn't even preaching then. And then I'd go and talk to my daddy and I'd say, I'm praying about this, but I really believe the Lord wants me to preach. And uh, this is what my daddy would say. If you can get out of it, son, get out of it. You, you probably want to grow up and be a, 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 a policeman or a doctor or a fireman or something else. Or, and he said, if you can get out of it, get out of it. You don't want, you don't want to be a preacher. And he discouraged me for a long time and uh, till I couldn't get out of it. It was such a burden that when I would look at the Word of God, I would feel like I was supposed to tell people what it said. And then I had to transition from the youthful novice that I wanted to tell them what I wanted to say yeah. to get back to that authority. But because of the Lord had helped me with that and my dad had helped me with that already, we had a basis of authority of the Word of God. It has been a challenge that has come up on a number of occasions, but still I go back to the Word of God, not myself, but the Word of God. And uh, so I get a burden about that thing. And then when I'd get a burden, I'd go to pray about it. Lord, I feel like somebody should tell that. I feel like somebody should preach that. I feel like somebody should say that. And the Lord gave me a chance, an opportunity to say something. And uh, the year before, I had come to the full surrender on the, the matter. Uh, a number of occasions arose. Preachers would say, we're having a youth meeting. How about you go testify to the young people? Boy, I'd go get me one of those notes out that I knew I had to tell somebody, and I'd tell them what God put on my heart. And that started happening. In April of 1987, I was attending a meeting, and uh, they had morning and night services. In the afternoon, the young people would gather in around the piano and sing and testify and pray and things like that. We had a, a really good group of people there that all on fire for God, love the Lord. And so I got up and testified in one of those meetings. And I shared a burden with the Lord had given me in a verse of scripture. 
and uh, and they were they were recording it. We didn't know that. They took it back to the preacher, and the preacher talked to my dad about it, asked if he could talk to me about it, and they got together and talked to me, and uh, and I, I shared my burden, and he said, I want you to to uh, take a five minutes in the evening service of this uh, preacher's meeting. I want you to take five minutes before the main speaker comes up, and I want you to just tell them whatever the Lord's put on your heart. You ever heard a preacher say that? Whatever the Lord's put on your heart. Whatever the Lord's put on your heart. Why do we say that? Because if the Lord hadn't put anything on your heart, and I'm not talking about looking at politics and saying, I could tell people about what Fox News, who cares about that? Yeah. I, I, could, I watched TV the other day and I knew I should tell somebody. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, I was in the Word of God and the Lord helped me with a Bible verse and a burden on the, on the heart that somebody needed to hear what thus saith the Lord. Yeah. That's what Habakkuk had. A burden from seeing what the Lord was going to do. And I have to tell the people about it. And I believe that's the second step in this calling. I think, first, if you have a proper placed authority in the Word of God and you build on that and you stay with that, then God begins to nurture your heart to squeeze you about things that need to be said out of the word of God and the key to that is learning that it's thus saith the Lord not what I said not what the preacher yeah. listen I listened to a preacher preach one time he preached on the prodigal son and this was his message he dropped his pail jumped the rail and hit the trail and uh, and and it was what he was preaching on he was down there in the hog pen you know and he got wised up to his situation so he dropped his pail he was in the hog pen, so he had to jump the fence, right? Jump the rail and hit the trail heading back to Father's house. I'm going to tell you, that's funny and it's easy to remember. But that guy, and he was in the ministry a very short time. Every message was a poetic uh, gesture of, of coin phrases or fancy little gizmos to try to get everybody's yeah. attention. Not thus saith the Lord. Amen. When you walked away, you could remember that phrase right. he dropped the yep. pail jumped the rail and hit the trail but you didn't know the lord better than you knew him when you got started and that's not the burden of the word of the lord yeah man the burden of the word of the lord is thus saith the lord and if that's not enough you don't even have another message that could ever be better than that message thus saith the lord yeah. we need to get back to that the psalmist David said in the 119th Psalm, the 140th verse, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Verse number 89 of that same chapter, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. You get a love for the word of God, and then all of a sudden you're reading that word or studying that word or a preacher's preaching. I've done this a number of times. I be The preacher be preaching. He says, turn over here, and I turn to the to the page and while he's reading I'm trying to find where I'm supposed to be and I see something in the word of God and I just want to make a note of that and see if the Lord wants to work on my heart with that because it's just jumped out there have been times when I've read chapter after chapter after chapter and it's just black and white on a page but when the Lord gets ready to speak he doesn't come with the voice and the visions and the dreams and clouds and Amen. all kinds of spooky things he comes with the word and I can go back to it and look at it. And there it is in my Bible. That's the word of yeah. God. And that burden gets on you that somebody needs to hear what thus saith the Lord. And that is an important thing. So while you're there in the Old Testament, let's flip forward to Zechariah. And uh, let's go to the ninth chapter. Verse number one. The burden of the word of the Lord in the land of Hadrach and Damascus shall be the rest thereof. When the eyes of man as all the tribes of Israel shall be toward the Lord. The burden, look at that first phrase, the burden of the word of the Lord in the land of Hadrach. Go over to chapter 12 of the same book. Verse number one, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretched forth his hand 
or stretch forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. I'm going to say in the simplest way I possibly can, a man who has desire to stand in front of people will not be enough. As a matter of fact, most of the leaders in the Bible didn't want to be leaders. And if you look at people like uh, Moses, couldn't see it in himself that he had what it took to stand up and lead the people. Most people don't say, I should be up there because I can tell people I have a way with words. I have. That's not, what, that's not a call of God. A call of God is a burden. They need to hear what thus saith the Lord. And I can tell them what the Lord said. I can share what the Lord said. And that's all we are as conveyors of what he has said already. It, uh, let me tell you a funny, if you don't mind, to stop here and just tell you a funny. My wife likes to see stuff in the clouds. You know how she does this with the kids. You know how women do or kids will do. They look up in the clouds and say, oh, look, shaped like a big teddy bear. Y'all see that? And they'll get to talking about it. You see that? And they're driving down the road the other day, and one of them saw a dinosaur. And they could see its hands, and they could see its body, and they could see its tail in the clouds. And I don't see half that stuff. And so, uh, and I probably carry on more about it. I probably could see some of those figures and shapes and all that, you know. They're not being spiritually led by it, but that's what, they're just. it's just for fun. But my wife and I were riding down the road the other day. On the, well, it's been a few uh, years now ago. We were on a motorcycle riding down the road. We stopped at a red light, and I looked up, and I leaned back, and I said, Hey, honey, do you see that? And she said, What is it? And I said, Moisture. <laughs> she didn't like that at all. My sarcasm, you know, sometimes gets the worst of me. And uh, so I said, Moisture. I was right. Moisture. And that's all there was up there, too, is moisture. But uh, she didn't see it the way I did. But you want to know the truth? There are people who walk into the church this week who are hoping to see a sign or a wonder or a cloud yeah. shaped like a cross, and they will dedicate their whole lives, to, and they never understand. That's not what God wants you to do. He wants you to follow <clears throat> his word. Yeah. And a man who gets up and preaches and accommodates a weak, anemic world with those little trickeries is not a God-called preacher. He hurts the cause of the ministry. He afflicts the ministry. Needy people need more than a cloud. They need more than a shape, a figure, a sign, a, 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 a feeling. One guy I know got up and he said, I was thinking the other day and I, I, I heard something and cold chills. Made the hair stand up on the back of my head. You need more than cold chills. You need more than goosebumps on your arms. Amen. You need thus saith the Lord. And if it's enough, if number one, the authority of Scripture is enough, then it'll get real to you and it'll be enough to become the burden that you need to carry to the people. But for a preacher to accommodate a weak, anemic world that we live in with that kind of foolery hurts the cause of Christ. Yeah. Not, not never be named among us that are Bible believers. If the Bible does not become a burden to you, if there's not a burden of the Word of God in you to tell the people what thus saith the Lord, then there's no call. There's, there's, no, there's nothing else to look for. There's got to be a burden for you to express the Word of God. When you look at somebody in need and you hear of their troubles and their problems and you think that you have the most cunning words and helpful words you're nothing more than Dr. Phil and Oprah. Yeah. And that's not what the church needs. Amen. But when you see somebody in need and you are automatically brought to a verse of Scripture and a burden is on you that you should tell them what thus saith the Lord, that's a burden of the Word of God that needs to be exchanged and shared with people. I'll give you a third reference in the Old Testament. Uh, we have looked at Habakkuk and Zechariah and look at Malachi, if you would, please. Chapter 1, verse number 1, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Every message a preacher stands in the pulpit to preach should somehow be described by these same words. A burden of the word of the Lord to the people. In this place, First Baptist Church, is it Ennis? 
Ennis. Ennis. Ennis, Texas. In this place, every preacher that stands up behind that pulpit ought to be standing up with the burden of the word of the Lord yeah, to the First Baptist Church in Ennis. Standing out there on that street corner preaching ought to be, I'm going to give these words, these verses, not some cute story about puppy dogs getting run over in the highway. That's not what saves souls. What saves souls is somebody stand out there on that corner and say, Thus saith the Lord, and give them the word of God. The word of God. I have a burden to carry the word of God to these people. If you don't have that, then there's nothing else to go on. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a man named Billy Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. But Billy Kelly was a good friend of mine, good friend of my family for years. My grandfather, good friend of his, good friend of my dad, good friend of me. Uh, my wife and I were traveling evangelism when Brother Kelly got in, up in years and, and uh, was near in death. And so for the last two years of his life, it worked out when the area we were working in to be able to drive through Greer and stay and visit with him on a number of occasions. Every few weeks we got to go and sit with him and talk with him. And he joked. And he was funny. He was, he was a great guy just to be around. And he was a hilarious guy. Tell stories. He told the same stories my whole life. Yeah. And they were just as funny the last time I heard them as they were the first time. But he jokes around and I you know, say, tell me about when God called you to preach. And he said, I woke up, I didn't want to go to work, and I was hungry for fried chicken. I knew God had called me to preach. <laughs> now, he's poking fun, and that, that, that'd that be enough for some people. And I appreciate the humor, but the truth is... He didn't travel all those years and preach the gospel all over the country yeah. because of fried chicken. Although I'm happy if we get some fried chicken. There has to be a burden for the word of the Lord. A burden for the word of the Lord. I'm going to tell you what I'm seeing. Um, I've graduated from a number of colleges. And I'll say that I'm not saying that to brag. I have to study all the time. I have a, uh, an issue the way that I learn that I don't retain a lot of things, I study all the time. I've graduated from a number of colleges. I'm in college right now. Uh, I'm in seminary working on a master's degree currently. I have three earned doctorate degrees. I have a number of other degrees that I've picked up in certifications I've gotten from a number of schools. And now all that means is I've gone to their school, finished their curriculum, and gotten their paper at the end. And then I have to keep studying. That's what my mind, the way my mind works. I have to keep working at it. I lose a lot of things that I put in. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I get older, it gets even worse, but I always have to be working at it. I notice when I take six months off how I begin to struggle in my own uh, verbiage and my language to be able to communicate, so I have to stay. School has become that thing that helps me. The problem with that is now I'm currently in a class with a bunch of 25-year-olds and 27-year-olds, uh, young guys, and, uh, and, and we share our testimony, and I'm, my mind's blown. <laughs> <laughs> and what these guys think they are, what they're, what they're called to do. And they talk about how God's, God's really opening the door for them. And, they're, and, and really all they're going to be is psychologists and philosophers. And yeah. they want to get in a pulpit because they're sure that if they could explain it in their yeah. words and tell it in their <laughs> way, that they're sure that they could just really help people. And I'm going to tell you, I hope one day they wake up and realize how silly that is. Because our churches don't need yeah. philosophers and psychiatrists and, and babble. Our churches need more men to stand up one after the other with a burden for the word of God. I've got to tell them what God's word says. And if you ever get away from that burden, get back to the burden of the word of the Lord. Because that is the call that moves us forward. When it gets heavy on you and it gets so heavy you've got to get it out. That burden of the word of the Lord is what those people actually need to hear. And that's what God uses men to do. Translate that thing from his word through burden to the hearts of people. And so, burden of the word of the Lord is necessary. Number three, C, a calling to the word of the Lord. It seems as though we've covered this already, but I don't think we have. I think if you put it in its proper order, you'll find the rightness in what's going on. We start with an authority of the Word of God, and we have a burden of the Word of the Lord, and now there's a calling to the Word of the Lord. I want you to go with me to Matthew or to Mark, rather. Mark chapter number three.
Mark chapter number 3, verse number 14. One simple verse. He ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. I'd like you to look at the process in that verse. The word ordained is a word that means ordered or commanded or called. He ordered them. He ordained them. He ruled on the matter that they should be with him. And this is first, that they be with him. I've underlined, I've marked the whole verse, but I've underlined this phrase, that they should be with him. That he might send them forth to preach. The preacher has his first calling to be with the Lord before he has a calling to be with the people. Yeah. Yeah. A man who does not feel the drawing work of the Lord to be with the Lord cannot ever be entrusted to be with the people. If I alliterate this for you, I'm sure you've heard it this way before, and it'll probably be easy for you to remember. There is a private ministry before there is a public ministry. Now, it is obvious that there are a lot of people before the people, with the people, for the people, by the people, promoted by the people, bragged on by the people, loved by the people. They're the people's choice, like Saul was the people's choice. They looked the part. Mm -hmm. They're head and shoulders above everybody else in their, in their academia and in their verbiage and their way of speech and their caring. They know how to walk it and talk it and act it out. And they're with the people, they're for the people, they're by the people. But they're missing the great element of first being with him. Yeah. With him. Let me see if I can walk through the scriptures real quick with you and just highlight some leaders. Noah led for the conversion of himself, his wife, three boys, and their wives, a total of eight people. Great ministry. He had a great ministry. If we all calculated that, we probably wouldn't want to be in the ministry if we thought of it like, man, I want to be like Noah. I'd like to end my life with eight converts. But Noah heard the word of the Lord, found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and acted upon it. When the people disagreed with him, he had a solid place to stand. He had been with the Lord. And he was used by God, and according to Hebrews 11, by faith, Noah built an ark being warned of God. <clears throat> yeah. He had time with the Lord. That's why he did what he did. Not a good sense, good head on his shoulders. There's a difference between a man with a call on his life and a prudent man who just thinks he knows better how to talk and better how to lead people or better how to handle people. You can read, uh, you can read Maxwell if you want and find how to be a good leader how to win friends and influence people. You can read Ziegler. You can read others in this world. You can get your leadership books out and, and, the, and, and be those kind of people that lead purpose-driven churches and purpose-driven lives and never be alone with God. Yeah. But Noah was alone with God, did what he did according to the word of the Lord. What about Moses we talked about? If he had not had a burning bush, if he had not gotten away from Egypt and Pharaoh's house and all the things that was going on there and got alone somewhere where God could deal with him and speak to him, and if he had not ever approached to hear the word, the voice come from that burning bush, he could not have led those people and done what he did, but he did everything that he did because of the voice that he heard in that bush. It's a mandatory thing that first our calling is to him before it is for him. A calling to him is vital. I think if we got near him, we would, in fact, become more active for him. But we are not active for him because we have not been with him. Yeah. What about Elijah? We don't know much about the old prophet Elijah before he's uh, blasting Ahab and Jezebel. Then... Uh, hidden off by the 
Brook Cherith, right? And then he's over at the widow's house, eating out of the bottomless barrel. And then, all of a sudden, he's at Mount Carmel, and he's, he's put to the very test of life. He says, time to decide. It's time to decide. We're drawing a line in the sand today. It's going to be your God, or it's going to be the true God, Jehovah God. We're going to find out today who God is. And I remember this story. You all know the story. I don't need to elaborate, but they worked all day cutting themselves, cast themselves on the altar, falling down, crying, praying, pitching a fit, had the praise and worship team going. They had the, the drama team going. Yeah. They had everything happening. They had all the stuff happening. When they got done with all that, no answer, no fire. And then Elijah mocks them. I like that. I know. <laughs> Again, my sarcasm sometimes gets the best of me, but I like the fact that he just rags on them, rags them a little bit. You know, Maybe he's a long ways off. He could be on vacation. <laughs> Cry louder. Do more. I mean, could be he's going to the bathroom. That's what that phrase pursuing means. Could be he's done going to the bathroom. He's in the he's in the port of John. Y'all gotta call out louder. He rags at them and he teases at them because their God's not answered. But then he gets serious and he prays what happens in our English words is sixty three words, very short and very simple prayer. But these are the three points of his prayer. He said, I want them to know that you're the true God. That's first. I want them to know that I'm your servant. That's second. And I want them to know that I've done everything I've done here this day according to thy word. And that weighs on my heart, brethren. The word of God. In other words, though we don't have it recorded, Elijah told us in that simple prayer that he had been alone with the Lord and that the Lord had instructed him in the movements of that day. Yeah. Because God did send fire down from heaven and he proved three things. He proved he was the true living God. He proved that Elijah was his man and he proved that Elijah had acted upon the word of God. That is vital. You don't have a Mount Carmel experience if you don't first have the alone time with the Lord and act on his word. And it is amazing even now how many times I want to have the Carmel experience when that's not what God's calling me to. Yeah. But Lord, if we could have the Carmel experience. And the Lord said, that's not what I'm doing right now. And see, just because Elijah had one doesn't mean I get one. This is not a equal yeah. rights for all preachers, yeah. right? And what about the Moses and Korah? I'd love sometimes for the earth to open up and God to swallow a bunch. Right? But this is not equal rights for all preachers. Moses had that because of Moses' time with the Lord. But what I will have because of my time with the Lord will be prevailing in my life and independently set on my time with the Lord as to what God does in my life. God will not always do the same for every man but he, he will do fruitful works of us being with him and for him. Amen. With him comes before him. Yeah. We get it out of, we get it out of sync. Now, let me, let me tell you what I think about the calling of God. I think that there are a lot more people called than, than are surrendered. We use those terminologies calling of God and surrender of God, but I believe that there's a great call of God that's ongoing. Do I have time to give a little reference to Isaiah? I've gone a long time. I'm going to quit here in a minute. Is that all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Um, he told me if we start at 7, I could go to 10. I don't know if that's what you guys were planning to do. No, I'm kidding. He didn't say that. Let me give this and I'll be done. Remember when Isaiah, the king died, and Isaiah's roaming around trying to figure out what's going on, and he goes to the temple. If you look at the text, Isaiah don't actually belong there. Everybody knows that, right? Isaiah goes into the temple where he doesn't really belong and actually goes into the holy place where he really does not belong. It's not Isaiah's place to be there. When you see the setting of Isaiah chapter number 6, he's in the holy place and, and goes in and sees the glory of the Lord. So he actually gets into the holies of holies. And I know you have that laid out here. You can see the idea of the tyrant. You, you're familiar with what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. When he's confronted with the word of the Lord, he immediately sees his sin. 
Nobody had to come down and say, Isaiah, you're a wicked people and live among the wicked people. As soon as the presence of the Lord and the realness of the Lord, yeah. and the word of the Lord is seen, Isaiah is confronted with his sin. Amen. And he goes to confess it. Isn't that what we all ought to do? We're confronted Amen. in the presence of the Lord. Amen. We ought to see ourselves. Immediately, <clears throat> there ought to be some things wrong. I asked some people the other day in the church, how many of them had sin in their life and nobody raised their hand? <laughs> Yeah. One lady told the preacher the other day she had been 50 years since she had committed a sin, and he said, I'm sorry you broke your record today because you just lied. She wasn't happy about that. She had two sins then, and she was angry without cause. Uh, but Isaiah's confronted with his sin. He goes to confessing and getting right with the Lord. Now, you can see the praise in there, and a lot of people only want to point out the holy, holy, holies, and all oh, the glory of God, and the house was moved and shaken in his presence. But look what else happens. Isaiah's confronted with his sin. That's what church service is missing. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to have the holy, 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 and they want to have the, the cherubims, but they don't want to have the confrontation with sin. But Isaiah mm -hmm. was confronted over his sin. And when he was confronted, he confessed. And he confessed, realizing he wasn't the only sinner in the whole place. He saw his national setting, and he went to confessing for himself and for his nation. And then look what happens next. He hears a voice. Now, if you study your Bible, you'll find in the, uh, in the syntax, Hebrew language, he hears a voice saying, who will go for us? And who shall we see him? Now guess what? When you study that and you look at the phrase in the syntax of that sentence, that voice was saying that all the time. But Isaiah could not hear it because the sin had not been dealt with. Mm -hmm. It didn't say, and then the Lord said to Isaiah. Right, right. That's not what he said. He heard a voice. It was an ongoing saying, who will go for us? And who will we send? Amazing how people can hear the praise, holy, holy, holy. But they never get to the call. Why? They never deal with the sin. And you can't hear him calling until you're willing to deal with your sin before the Lord and be cleansed. Yeah. Amen. And after that fire, that, that tongue touch him, he hears something that was ongoing, the calling of the Lord. And I believe there's a lot more people called than are submitting because they're not getting through that system to get there where God can uh, open their ears to hear. Why do you think the scripture in the New Testament keeps repeatedly saying, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the church. The, the sayings are ongoing. The calling is ongoing. The move of God is ongoing. He's not stopped one thing he's ever started doing. He's ongoing with his call of God. But the people of God are not in the place of God where they need to be so that they can hear him. So he's calling us to himself. He ordains us that we may be with him. And then, when you get with him, get yourself in that place where you can be alone with God. Get right with the Lord. Get thoroughly cleansed. Cleaned up ready. You'll hear the calling of God. And you'll know, it is my burden to tell the people, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. Isaiah had no problem saying... Here am I. Send me. He was troubled just a few verses earlier, but being with the Lord clarified and cleaned all that up. And then he was willing to go where God wanted him to go. I'm in a transition in my life. You don't have to know my whole story, but I've spent the last 10 years replanting churches in Florida, uh, helpless little bodies, church, churches with only half a dozen people in them and we've been working at that for 10 years and um, and the Lord's moved the burden away from that we we knew that burden was leaving and changing and the direction was changing and uh, we're in that transition period now the Lord's opening doors for us to be in places like tonight this was unplanned and unpredicted God knew we were going to be here and God put it on the pastor's heart to allow me to speak tonight I'll be preaching tomorrow at a place that was unplanned Six months ago, I had no idea I would be right where I'm at right now, but I'm right where the Lord wants me to be. Amen. And he's opening those doors. And people often say to me, well, where are you going and what are you doing? I have no idea. I don't need to anymore. Yeah. That's good. That's good. All I need to know is 
He'll give me a burden and he'll open a pulpit or a place, a platform for me to give that burden to the people. I've surrendered to that over and over. But surrender is not a one-time thing. It's a day-by-day, moment-by-moment thing. Amen. And I keep coming back to here am I, send me, here am I, send me. And he burdens me like today with this and I'm delivering it. And I go to bed tonight with that burden delivered as happy as I can be that I was here with you doing what God called me to do. You'll never find anything greater in your life than to be able to say that's what you've done. Yeah. I was obedient to the heavenly vision. I'm done what God's called me to do. And that's a good way to end, isn't it? Amen. Let me pray, and then I'm going to turn it back over to our pastor. Father, thank you for the time we've had together in this study setting, and thank you for the occasion to open up the Word of God. Oh, my heart and my mind are flooding with memories of the ways and things you've done to work in my life that have brought me to this place. And I am thankful for what you've been doing and what you're doing now to direct us. And again tonight, I'm, I'm minded that I must come to you and be with you, that there is a place by me, a place you want me to be by your side, standing on that rock, doing your will, preaching your word, thankful that you called me. I've done a lot of things in my life. This is the greatest thing I've ever been allowed to do with my life, is declare, thus saith the Lord. And I thank you and I rejoice. Thank you for this place. Thank you for the people who are listening tonight. I pray. He would give us ears to hear what the Spirit saith of the church in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, brother. Amen. Okay. That was a blessing. Amen. I hope y'all got something out of it. Amen. Uh, it was a blessing. Um, any questions? That can be answered in five minutes or so. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, amen. You said Cambridge 19, the Bible issue? Around 1900, uh, the Cambridge made correction on 12 things they found that were in error. And I, I'd be glad to show them to you, or we can have another few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask about that, too. <laughs> I knew you was. <laughs> Uh, okay, is that the one that Scrivener did, or was that after him? Um, I have to look, but I think that's after him. Yeah, I but, think so. I haven't. I don't think I've heard of the nineteen, the one close to nineteen hundred. Uh, so that that'd be pick your brain on it. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, amen. God bless y'all. Uh, uh, remember, uh, tomorrow, uh, 7 o'clock, we'll be in Exodus. Exodus, yes. Amen. Something like that. Amen. God bless y'all. Thank you, brother. Amen.